You buying gasoline this weekend? There's a lot you think you know that isn't so. Where do we get most of the oil from? Well, I think like Arabian countries. I think like Saudi Arabia. Um, India. Um, Afghanistan. Is America going to run out of gasoline? Yes. When? Probably in 2015. Why does the price go up and down so much? Are the oil speculators manipulating it? They want to make their money, of course they are. Bill O'Reilly agrees. I go to Gulf, I go to Shell, I go to Texaco, I go to Getty. It's the same price. We make a bet about that. I want a thousand dollars on that. Fortunately, this woman knows more about how to lower the price of gas. No baby drill. But so many Americans believe in nonsense. Electric cars, are they better for the environment? much better for the environment and for our money. We can save money. Is putting ethanol in our cars good for America? Yeah, totally. Because if it was cheaper energy, lower money, lower gas, yeah. There are lots of myths about gasoline. That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Talking to people at gas stations, I learned that oil companies are evil. Their profits are excessive. Electric cars, however, they're good. Good for the world. And we're going to run out of oil in the year 2015. In 2015, what are we going to do then? We're going to skateboard, rollerblade, scooter, bike ride. That sort of green paradise does appeal to people, uh, as does America becoming energy independent. Who could object to that? Well, Jerry Taylor of the Cato Institute does, and so does the author of Power Hungry, Robert Bryce. Robert, what's wrong with energy independence? Everybody loves energy independence. <laughs> well, I suppose, John, but uh, why not banana independence and iPod independence? Um, look, this is, this is the most hackneyed phrase in modern American politics. We've heard it from every president since the days of Richard Nixon. The reality is that we live in an ever more integrated global economy, and whether we're talking about gasoline or iPods, iPhones, fresh flowers, tennis rackets, the, those markets are all global. Why would we want to be independent of the world's biggest, most important, most transparent market? It, it makes no sense at all. Because people say we don't need tennis rackets and ice cream, we need oil. We can't rely on these evil countries. Which evil countries are we talking about? Canada? I, I'm not aware of, of loads of jihadis in Canada. They're our biggest provider of, of, of crude. So what's wrong with Canada? What's wrong with Mexico? They, have uh, for decades, have been one of our leading suppliers. Jerry Taylor, you want to add to that? Even if all of our crude oil came from a hole in the ground in Alaska, you know, let's just assume we all got our oil from Alaska, we're energy independent because of it. If the Saudi Arabians experienced a terrorist attack and lost some supply, or if there was a war with Iran and they went off the market, the price of Alaskan crude would be just as high as the price of, say, Saudi crude or Yemen crude or any other crude because it's a global market. It doesn't matter. It's sort of like if there's a frost in Florida that devastates the, the citrus crop. Citrus from California is going to become more expensive, too. So energy independence doesn't protect us against supply disruptions abroad. What about the little girl's claim? She said 2015. That's sort of silly. But people say we are going to run out. You suck the stuff out of the ground. And I've heard predictions about when we're going to run out for a long time. The oil and natural gas that we rely on for 75 percent of our energy are simply running out. Running out. To believe that we're about to run out of crude oil is to believe that there will no longer be any technological innovations in production, that there will be no response to high price. I find that fairly hard to believe, and that's why we haven't run but out yet. I've been hearing it for years. President Carter is no dummy. Robert, what's... I mean, the, the reality is, uh, John, that the more oil we find, the more oil we find. Let's just look at the last 20 years. In, in 1990, uh, U.S. proved oil reserves were about 34 billion barrels. By 2010, U.S. proved reserves were about 31 billion barrels. Those are reserves we know we can drill for and, and produce. Well, over that 20-year period, the U.S. produced over 50 billion barrels of oil. So the proved oh, reserves, we, we've, 
Well, again, the more oil we find, the more oil we find. Wow. And that's what we found, well, because, as Jerry said, it's technological innovation. The combination of horizontal drilling, uh, John, and hydraulic fracturing, which a lot of the environmentalists don't like, uh, the reality is that this has resulted in an enormous amount of natural gas coming to the market, so much so that today natural gas is selling for about $2, $2.50. Four years ago, it was selling for $10. This is a remarkable windfall for the U.S. economy. Economy. The hard reality is that the oil and gas sector has out-innovated the solar and wind sectors over the last four years, and they've done it in spades. Yeah, they're spending their own money. That incentivizes them. <laughs> and uh, It's a big incentive. Next myth, uh, Jerry, the oil companies are making disgusting profits well, at our expense. Well, it turns out that the average U.S. manufacturer makes about $0.08 cents a profit on every dollar's worth of earnings. The average oil and gas company makes about six cents of profits on every dollar's worth of earnings. Oil and gas companies actually don't do all that well, but they do post big numbers, right? We hear that Exxon yeah, Mobil made thirty four billion. Nine billion this quarter. Exactly. Shell, seven billion. Yeah. Well it's relative to what? These are huge companies and they're huge because, well, they sell a lot of product and they invest a lot. But relative to the size of their business, they're actually not particularly profitable industries to be in. Next myth. Where does our gasoline come from? Where do we get most of our gas? Out of the country? I know it's not from America. From the Middle East. Um, India? I'm not really sure. <laughs> Probably, um, um, Afghanistan? Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Canada. All right. Uh, he was getting closer, at least. Uh, Robert, Canada, you, as you pointed out, we get a lot of oil from Canada, but we get most of it from America, right? Well, U.S. oil production is increasing rapidly, and so is production from Brazil. So that when it comes to the future of U.S. oil use, a lot more of it is going to be coming from right here in the Western Hemisphere, Canada, U.S., Mexico, Brazil, and less and less from the Middle East. So why don't people know this? Almost everybody I ask has no clue that most of it comes from the United States. Because the policy world is obsessed with the Middle East. Conservatives like to argue that we need to be energy dependent so that we can have a foreign policy more to their liking that is disentangled from our reliance on Middle Eastern crude. Environmentalists want to scare us away from crude oil because they say, well, it's all coming from bad guys abroad and terrorists and we don't want that. The reality is, is that 55% of our crude oil more than half of it comes from the United States. That's the number one supplier. And of the, of the imports that we get, 52% of them total, all imports are from Canada and Mexico. The Persian Gulf countries are responsible for only about 10% of U.S. consumption. But people think it all comes because from Saudi Arabia. Because this entire conversation is about the Middle East, the Middle East, the Middle East. The reality is they're a small contributor to U.S. Uh, uh, refineries. Now, what about green energy? That little girl talked about skateboards and bicycles. And, you know, she's a little girl. But uh, we hear from adults that electric cars are better for the environment and good for America. Robert? New York Times uh, reporter wrote that the electric car has long been recognized as the ideal solution because it is cleaner and quieter and much more economical than gasoline-fueled cars. That's the New York Times, November 12th, 1911. We've, we've been hearing about the future of the electric car for a century. This, the history of the electric car is a century of failure, tailgating failure. Why do we use gasoline? Because gasoline has 80 times the energy density of the best lithium-ion batteries. Why didn't uh, b uh, electric cars catch on in Edison's day? Because batteries were, were lousy. Today, batteries are still lousy. They're too heavy, they're too finicky, and they cost too much. And that's why uh, we use gasoline. It's why we use diesel fuel, because it's an incredibly energy-dense, flexible, easy-to-use product. And the other hype about the electric car is it's better for the earth. Well, if you think that coal's better for the earth, then fine. But, I mean, that's where coal. most of our electricity comes from. It comes from coal-fired power plants. It's pretty hard to make an argument that coal and natural gas, an aggregate on the grid, are less polluting than the gasoline out of the cars. It's kind of a wash. And even the environmentalists have now come around to say, okay, electric car is not so great. Someday. Next myth. Uh, politicians tell us if we just use more ethanol in gasoline, we'll create a nation that is stronger, cleaner, and more secure. Hey, stronger, cleaner, more secure. I'm for that. Every last word of that is incorrect. Uh, <laughs> 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 at a boy, Jerry. <laughs> it, 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 it turns out it's not cleaner. 
uh, if you take evaporative emissions into consideration, ethanol has more emissions of hydrocarbons, of nitrogen oxides, of non-methane uh, uh, organic compounds and air toxics. And so ethanol, when you take evaporative emissions into consideration, what comes up when you refuel it, is bad for the environment. It's not good for the environment. It also has a higher... Even Al Gore has come around on this and said, oops, we shouldn't have forced it into gasoline. Virtu and virtually every environmental organization has come around on that front. And we simply, even if that weren't the case, we don't have enough corn. But we're all forced to use <laughs> ethanol. Finally, uh, later in this show, I'll talk to Sarah Palin, famous for saying, drill, baby, drill. And people think more drilling would make a huge difference. Robert, truth or myth? Well, look, I, I'm in favor of drilling. Mm. You're going to wait a long time for me to say that it, that it isn't positive for the economy. I, drilling might bring in another million barrels of oil. Yeah, if the uh, oil geologists are correct about what we are likely to find in these areas, which we have not thoroughly explored yet, and they may be wrong. But if their mean estimates are correct, we could probably get about 800,000 barrels of crude oil production a day from Anwar when that field is maturely producing. Per day? Sounds per like day. a lot. And 200,000 barrels in the, uh, off the coast of the United States, which is currently off limits to the industry. So for a million barrels a day? A million barrels a day in an 88 million barrel a day crude oil market, world crude oil market, translates into about a 1% reduction in price. Now, that's all well and good, but 1% reduction in world crude oil prices is not going to be noticeable by most American consumers. Thank you, Jerry Taylor and Robert Bryce. We've just begun debunking the myths. Coming up, we'll see what Sarah Palin says about drilling making a difference. But first, what Bill o will Bill O'Reilly pay me the thousand bucks he owes me? I want a thousand dollars on that. I want a thousand. I'll fight with Bill when we return. Did you buy gasoline this week? Did you get ripped off? How would you know? Well, one guy who's sure he's getting ripped off is my colleague Bill O'Reilly. He's right about a lot, but on this he is just out to lunch. He says your local gas station colludes with other gas stations to fix the price. He says America should put limits on oil price speculation and that America should impose a fat tax on any business that dares ship our oil overseas. I bet lots of Americans agree with him. He does have the most popular cable show anywhere. But in this case, he's just wrong about all of it. I went to his studio to try to convince him. All right, you get a lot of stuff right, but you get this wrong. Three things. You say oil speculators are bad and they drive the price up. And Correct. we should put some limits on them. Correct. You have to, my, my solution to the speculation problem in oil is to uh, require 50%. So if you buy some contracts, down. you've got to pay 50% for them. Look, when I buy a stock, I don't buy on margin. I've got to pay the stock broker for the stock. Why do speculators have to pay 10% or 5% of what they do? Explain that to me. Because that's how futures markets no, work. It gives not, them that, the leverage. That's not the way, yeah, because that's how it works. That shouldn't be how it works. <laughs> it works for Let's all these other products. Let's get the crooks out products. and get the serious people in. I don't mind speculation. But why are they crooks? Like that. Because they're basically day trading. They're basically, they don't sure. want the oil. Right. It's Vegas, all right? If they want to go to Vegas, go. All right, if they want to go to Mohegan Sun, go. But we all need oil to live. And I don't want a commodity that I need, my family needs to live, to be the subject of speculators who are gambling like they would be in Vegas. Well, then I have a commodity for you, onions. I don't need it. Well, this is the one product that the government said we're going to stop speculation in. In 1958, the no, U.S. Agri the Agriculture onion. Department oh, right. was so upset that the price of onions went up. Speculative right. activity. I don't care about onions or any of this other Hear me out. Stuff. It's my show. Speculative activity <laughs> causes severe and unwarranted fluctuations in the price. They right. ban yes. it. Yes. Since then, what's happened? The price has gone up and down more, Look, and onions went up more than oil Oil is not year. a free market. Onion growing is. And oil... To, in well, it's order a free to, market. No, it's not. Because you have to get government approval to look for it, to so ship what? it. Right? That's not a free market. That's controlled by a government. You, Stossel, can't start the Stossel Oil Company. Like, remember when you had that little lemonade stand out there? I couldn't even start okay. that. Well, I, this I can't one, start the Stossel Onion Company. This one, you wouldn't even be able to apply. All right? All right because you're on. All right. Because you know I'm right. That's why you're moving on. No, you're wrong. <laughs> 
you're also wrong about your plan to lower the price of oil by taxing companies that send it out of the country, that export it. I don't expect that to lower the price of oil. I just want economic justice. Kind of like the communists that are running around with the Occupy Wall Street movement. That's what you, well, and you here's like why. That. Who owns the land in the United States? Who? Private Let, let's sing the song. You ready? Government. Let's have everybody out there watching sing the song. This land is your land. <laughs> this land is my land. Remember that song? You're old enough. You probably wrote it. All right. <laughs> now, so, now, so you ban it. No, no, no. The land is our land. Where does the oil come from? Under the land. Therefore, we the people own the oil. OK, so then you have ExxonMobil coming right in and say, we'll drill it for you, Bill, because I can't drill it myself. And I say, OK, guys, just give me a fair cut when you find it. All right. And they say, sure, Bill. Boom. They drill. There it goes. Texas gold. All right. Great stuff. Yeah. And then they load it on a tanker and send it to China. I don't want my oil going to China when oil prices here are so high. You want to punish want American to companies it. that are good at refining. Yes. Keep it here. You find You're it punishing here. punishing American keep companies. Free punishing. trade is good. I'm still going to pay the 350 what? a gallon here. You want to keep everything we make in America no. here? No. I want you Just to be oil. deported. All right? <laughs> No, but it, my oil is your oil, and I don't want it shipped over to China, which raises my price on the oil. Why don't you see this? Because they would retaliate. This would make all no of retaliation. Us and it's a free trade is good. This is a bad it's, idea. Uh, your last point. You say that gas stations collude. They yes, set the price. Yes. We had a bet about that. Let's let's play the clip of that. I go to Gulf, I go to Shell, I go to Texaco, I go to Getty. It's the same price. I don't believe you. I bet it's not the exact same price. I'm going to check. Oh, I want a thousand dollars on that. I want a thousand. Can I get a thousand on okay. that? I'm going to hold him up by his ankles and just have all the money drop out of him right there. All right. So we made the thousand dollar bet. Yes, and I paid off the bet even though I didn't lose it. You were right, because we had different Wait, locations. You didn't lose it. Look, here, here it is. You lost look? it. Northern Boulevard between Great Neck and Manhasset. They got four stations. Four. All right. They always have the price either identical or one penny off. Always. No, it's, what it's is that, a coincidence? There are websites now that list them on the Internet. You can check every day. Every day the prices are different. And we checked Gulf, Getty, Shell, Mobile. They all had different prices. Not in, my, not in that location they don't. And they look. I, these people can't even speak English. How no. do they collude if they can't speak English? Well, because it's they, hard get a little, to they get a little. No, here, that's a good question. The first one you've asked. They get a little fax, a little text. This is what you will be charging today, and that, no, and they and they, they slam that don't. thing. Yes, they do. You're wrong about that. But uh, again, for the record, what, you're a stand-up guy. Yeah. You're a stand-up guy. You pay. You not just paid the thousand dollar bet. You paid five thousand dollars to Stossel in the classroom. I assume it was a mistake. Stossel no, in I the classroom. You wanted to no, give no, me no. That. We look. Um, I am. I, I want to bet more with you if I get five thousand, one thousand dollars. I felt sorry for you. That's why I did it. I didn't want to niggle because it is a good charity. But I will tell you this, and everybody should know this: the oil companies are not your friend. We are getting hosed at the pump, and for all of the things that we discussed tonight. Thank okay. you, Bill O'Reilly. Okay. He's wrong about everything, but right about one thing: the oil companies are not our friends. They are greedy, self-interested, ruthlessly competitive companies. And later, I'll explain why we should be thankful for that. And Sarah Palin will share her ideas on how government could lower the cost of gas. But next, we'll talk more seriously about those evil oil speculators. What does speculation really do? Bill O'Reilly and President Obama have something in common. Both want to crack down on those greedy oil speculators. Last month, the president said he will. We can't afford a situation where some speculators can reap millions while millions of American families get the short end of the stick. Do Americans get the short end of the stick because of speculators? Fox business reporter Charles Payne is a speculator. Charles, a lot of Americans think you greedy speculators make prices rise. I, you know, I, first of all, the things that Bill O'Reilly said blew me away, John. I just, I, you know, if you don't mind, I want to start there. Because okay. just the idea that the oil belongs to all of us is, I mean, that's like the most Marxist thing I've ever heard him say. <laughs> I, realistically, if, if, 
I would love to be able to go have Bill drive home tomorrow night, and when he gets there, I pitch the tent on his lawn. And me and my family and my friends are cooking out because guess what? It's our land. It's not his house. It's not his property. It's our land. And then, of course, the idea that somehow speculators are always right. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how J.P. Morgan lost $2 billion doing what? Speculating. So you can actually lose money speculating. They don't always make money. You don't always put a hole in the ground and black gold rushes out. But don't speculators raise the price? They bid it up? Make us pay more? Speculators bet on the idea that the price will go up. They're making a bet that ultimately the price will go up. So what drives the well, price? Some also bet some it will bet, go right, down. Because every time you do a transaction, there's a buyer and a seller. Someone's on the other side of that trade. So someone is speculating that it goes down. And, of course, when it does go down, no one gets the credit. No speculators have never gotten a credit when it goes down. Only when it goes you up. You see what natural gas prices are these days? Oh, my Love. God. They've come down so dramatically that they're putting the coal, helping along with the EPA, putting the coal industry out of business, but creating a tremendous amount of jobs. Let's go back to speculation. Bill O'Reilly says, I don't want to ban speculator, speculators. I just want them to put 50 percent down. What's wrong with that? Well, uh, first of all, if I buy through a company and they say, Charles, you can you can buy in 10 percent margin. That's, again, a private transaction between me and this company. Now, you know, I can see maybe where someone might be a little worried that this is a mini AIG and they're letting a lot of people buy uh, on, and, and they can't cover the cost. But the idea that, that you can arbitrarily throw a number out there, 50 percent, you know, and it gets back to the idea that somehow they don't have skin in the game. But they are making a bet. They lose on these bets and they win on these bets. And behind the idea is that speculation itself is bad. But my understanding is that these people making bets on the futures markets, they, the reason the onion price fluctuated more because speculation was banned is because speculation means it's like the story of the Aesop fable story about the ant and the grasshopper. The Grasshopper just right. spends it now, but the ant saved for the rainy day. In Absolutely. a way, that's what speculators In a way, that's, that's what they do. They, and they understand that there could be a shortage somewhere down the line, and when there's a shortage, they'll, they'll have it, and they'll be able to supply it. And, but, and when they start to supply it, the price comes back down. Uh, you know, the bottom line is that this helps to regulate the market. Uh, and th the finger pointing at speculators is irresponsible. Uh, it, it points away. It, to be quite frank with you, people should be so much more upset again at government, the amount of money that they're taking, the onerous rules and regulations, the inability to drill more. You know, when Bill O'Reilly talked about drilling on, on lands, yeah, if the government would put out more options, because, you know, our government owns like two thirds of the land in this country. I think about half, but a hell of a lot of it. Well, I tell you what, they uh, uh, will. We'll, yeah, let's even say half. That's a lot of land, a lot of potential. And as far as selling it overseas, we're not selling oil per se. But you know what? If we refine it into jet fuel and they need to buy it in China, that's what trade is all about. That is, that's what we want to do. We, we're, we are in a global economy. And the idea that we don't want to take advantage of a global economy is nuts. There's 300 million Americans. There's 5 billion other people that are coming up around the rest of the world. We better tap into them. Trade is win-win, though. It's hard to explain that to people. Thank you, Thank Charles you. Payne. Appreciate it. Up next, Sarah Palin on the supply of oil and more myths. That's vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin in 2008. But the current administration is less keen on that. And they've also said no to that Keystone pipeline, which would have brought more Canadian oil to America. They say they just want to protect our environment. Governor Palin joins us now. You've called their attitude terrifyingly naive. Yes, our president uh, really is clueless when it comes to the need for an energy policy. He really doesn't have an energy policy for America, except to um, kowtow to foreign dangerous regimes, asking them to produce energy that we have here underfoot, not only in Alaska, which is so resource rich, but in the Dakotas, in Pennsylvania, in Texas, California, Louisiana, offshore. Um, God has just dumped this, this, uh, this cornucopia full of resources underfoot, and it just takes political will to tap into them. The environmentalist claim about, say, the Keystone Pipeline, it would transport raw toxic tar sand oil right through the American heartland would wreak environmental havoc. And they got protesters to join them in protesting that. 
wonder if they realize that our nation is woven together with pipelines. I don't think that the environmentalists are um, uh, sane and sound at all with this argument against Keystone, which would produce and flow about 700,000 barrels of oil, safe, friendly oil, into our market. Um, it makes absolutely no sense that this one particular issue that they've just gotten so we weed up about. John, what it's all about is fundraising for the environmentalists. It's just like, oh, can't open Anwar, though no good sound reason for not opening Anwar, a tiny little pinprick that's needed up there in a corner of Alaska to explore for more oil and gas, except that it's kind of like a poster child for the environmentalists' fundraising efforts. Keystone has become that. All right, we'll get to Anwar in a moment. Let's do more in Keystone. The activists basically won. They got the protesters out. We're showing video now of people yelling, stop the pipeline. Yes, we can. And tar executives, not this earth. Uh, you say it's clean oil, but it is tar. It's gross oil. If it did spill, and it could spill. Uh, another group said it could cause a BP-like oil spill in America's heartland, the source of fresh drinking water for two billion people. It sounds terrifying to people. Um, onshore drilling is much safer than the deep offshore drilling that um, has been uh, seen in, in the news relatively lately. So this should be something that environmentalists could embrace um, as opposed to having to force more offshore oil exploration and developments if they're not going to allow us the safe onshore drilling. And um, John, America has the highest standards in the world when it comes to environmental protection. When the mainstream media, or the lamestream media, as I like the way you put mm -hmm. it, uh, talk mm -hmm. about Keystone, uh, they showed this map. And they implied that this giant, gross pipeline would pollute pristine, clean America. The media, though, rarely showed this map, which shows how many pipelines already exist in America. You think media bias is part of the problem? tiny bit of liberal media bias and um, that base of President Obama's, the environmental um, uh, fundraisers that dump money into, so traditionally anyway, uh, leftist politicians. Now you're famous for your drill baby drill line. Uh, President Bush opened up the east and west coast to drilling, but before it could really happen, President Obama shut that down. The president has been dishonest with the American public about what he has allowed, if you will, uh, the drilling that is taking place. Not only did President Bush tee up the drilling that we see going on now, but President Obama taking credit for private sector and state land allowance of drilling is um, it's quite disingenuous because the president doesn't have control over that aspect of the energy industry. What he does have control over is federal lands. And yet he has locked those up. If we drilled more earlier on the show, one of my guests said, wouldn't make that much difference, maybe 1% uh, to the price of gas. Uh, we've been hearing that for how many years? We've been hearing that uh, we shouldn't tap into Anwar because, shoot, it'll only produce some, say, 10 years worth of energy security and independence for America. Well, then we should have done it 10 years ago. And heck, even if it was just 1%, my goodness, isn't that better than nothing? That 1% will allow trade imbalances to kind of even out. It will allow more hundreds of thousands of jobs to be created if we were drilling everywhere, as, the, um, as that pundit had claimed that we uh, perhaps could be. Well, we should be. We have more oil here than anything that we would ever have to look to to import from these foreign countries if only, again, we had the political will to tap into it. Let's close then by talking about some of that oil, Anwar, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Now, maybe you could explain this to me because I don't know Alaska geography, uh, but it's the size of South Carolina by itself. Drilling there is off limits now, but the drilling footprint, if they drilled, would be small, like laying a three-foot welcome mat on a basketball court or a postage stamp on a football field. That's the equivalent of the uh, thumbprint that is needed for that drilling, especially with new technology and the directional drilling allowing. Because the drill um, goes the drill in and goes sideways. Right, right. Um, so it, it's... It, 
Alaska is, is hundreds of millions of acres. It, it, it's huge. I mean, it, it's two and a half times the state of Texas. We're asking for 2,000 acres, and that's it. It's about the size of LAX, a typical big city airport, that um, size of a parcel to allow the oil companies to be on there, drilling for the oil, tapping into it. And then, John, flowing it into the existing Trans-Alaska oil pipeline, the 800-mile pipeline that used to produce about 25 percent of the U.S. domestic supply of energy. Now it's way, way down. We went from about 2 million barrels a day now to about 700,000 barrels a day. It needs to be full. It, 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 um, environmentally and engineering-wise, it flows oil better the fuller it is. It makes no sense that we can't tap but the resources what, what up there. what if something breaks and it'll just destroy this pristine environment? What has broken in the last 30-some years in that Trans-Alaska oil pipeline? Nothing, except one crazy dude once who shot a gun and uh, poked a hole in the, in the Trans-Alaska oil pipeline. I don't want er erosion of that infrastructure. I don't want that atrophy of the, of the um, pipeline. I want to make sure that oil companies are adhering to the lease agreements that they make with the owners of the resource. And Charles Payne, love him, but he's wrong. It's not a socialist view here when we recognize that in Alaska, read our Constitution, the oil reserves underground are owned commonly. Not one person or one family or one business owns any of the oil. It is owned in common. And, um, and that's why, it, as a governor, sometimes you know, people wanted to run me out of town saying, you're, you're too tough on the oil companies. And I'm saying, hey, the, the oil is owned collectively, and I'm working for the people of Alaska. We've got to make sure that there is integrity, uh, both engineering wise, um, ethical uh, legislation, uh, vote buying and all the kind of stuff that sometimes you hear about in, in politics that becomes corrupt. I oversaw all that, John, and I made sure that the oil companies were adhering to the leases in their agreement. And, you know, that's what it took. Exxon finally, they got their drill rigs out there. They hired the guys and um, they're up there. We finally see some action. Thank you, Governor Palin. Thank you. Coming up. More myths about oil and gasoline. High octane gas. Is this better for your car? <laughs> We're back with your questions for my guests. Jerry Taylor from the Cato Institute, Fox Business reporter Charles Payne, and Robert Bryce, author of the book Power Hungry. First, from my Facebook page, Joey Kirkland says, why doesn't there seem to be a direct correlation between crude prices and at the pump gas prices? Well, there is. It turns out that uh, if you do the, uh, do the different math and run the computer models, there's about a 90% correlation between variations in world crude oil prices and variations in pump prices. So it's the main driver. Joey, apparently you're wrong. All right, let's go to the audience here. Yes, yes sir. Hello. Uh, many argue that uh, increasing oil production would have a negligible impact on uh, gas prices since it's uh, sold in the world market. However, why do you so many people ignore the other side of the coin, and that is it's still profit that we could keep here either way? Oh, that's absolutely true. It turns out that if you want to argue that increasing production out of ANWR and the OCS is going to reduce prices at the pump, you're just going to be wrong. You're not going to notice any change. That does, that's not an argument against it, however. If you, do, uh, if you look at a study done by a fellow named Robert Hahn, who's a very good guy at Oxford University, he found the net benefits of that drilling would be about $1.7 trillion over the entire history of that investment. That's a lot of jobs. That's a lot of profit. That's a lot of wealth creation that's worth going forward with. It's just that if you want to you know, get all chesty and say, well, gasoline prices would be $2 a gallon if we could just drill in Anwar and drilling the Gulf of Mexico and drill off California, you're just wrong. Well, I like also the idea of uh, creating jobs and keeping money here, to your point. And I think we need more refineries, which no one talks about and they haven't been approved. If we had more refineries to refine the extra crude, I think it would have an impact on the price of gasoline. Yes, sir. Many critics of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan claimed that we only went to war in order to keep Middle Eastern oil flowing. Uh, if it's really true that we don't get nearly as much oil from the Middle East as the critics at least claim, are they, are they then suggesting a myth that needs to be busted? No, not really. I mean, think about it. We don't import any crude oil from Iran. But everyone understands that if there was some sort of war in it with Iran and Israel or if we went to war with Iran and, they and their production went away, it would have a huge impact on gasoline and oil prices. Why? 
because it doesn't matter where the oil comes from. A supply disruption anywhere in the world is going to increase the price of crude everywhere else in the world by about the same amount. So just because we don't get our crude from the Middle East doesn't mean that what happens in the Middle East isn't going to have an impact on our on our prices. Even if all of our oil came from Alaska, we'd still have to worry about what happened. But we're not getting the oil from there. And I mean, you know, China's going to get more oil out of Iraq than we will. I, I, uh, than we will. So uh, I think anyone who says that is, is being, uh, I, I think they're mis- being misled. Yes, sir. Well, what do you think is the government's role in all this? Should the government be controlling this free market? And do they have the right more, more importantly, do they have the right to make us pay all this extra money for a product which they're not putting any work into? Well, yeah, keep in mind Sarah Palin, that great avatar of conservatism and free markets, <laughs> was bragging about how in the state of Alaska they own almost all the oil up there, and darn it, they're going to make sure that every last penny they can squeeze from the companies in return to the taxpayers is going to be done. Now, if she were really the conservative she advertised, she, as governor, might have promoted a plan which would have privatized that land. Notice that Sarah Palin said a lot about the need for an energy plan, an energy plan, an energy plan. Why does the government need an energy plan? What? We, don't have, we don't have an auto plan. I mean, that, that kind of rhetoric gives away the game. What she's saying is the government doesn't have some comprehensive five-year, 10-year, 15-year plan to impose its will on the energy sector and to have its will made manifest in the market. And that's just a bad signal. Any politician who talks that way is a politician who's talking about government intervention, not free market. Uh, do you still have the microphone, Spencer? Okay, so uh, it was a good question, obviously. Uh, so how old are you? I am 15 years old. All right, I should say he's here because he was one of the contest winners in the Stossel in the Classroom contest, an essay contest where the kids were asked to write about the unintended consequence of government programs. You won a free trip here to New York, attending the show, a uh, thousand bucks. That's right. Wow. Okay. <laughs> he was the he was the first runner up, and uh, the winner is next to him. She's only how old are you? Thirteen. Thirteen years old. You win fifteen hundred dollars. You have a question also. Yes, to your guests, I was wondering, I know you talked about ethanol and electric cars. Would you give some more examples of some fuel favorites of environmentalists that are not actually environmentally friendly? Well, biofuels is one of them. And they remember, it's not just for them. It's not just corn ethanol. It's this idea that switchgrass or poplar trees or some other plant that uh, could be used then to, to create uh, large amounts of motor fuel, it simply can't be done. This is one of the, the, the longest running bits of foolishness coming out of the green left in America. And it's so easily debunked. It's remarkable. They keep saying it. Thank you, Robert Bryce, Jerry Taylor, Charles Payne. Coming up, I'll debunk more myths about gas. Why is the price what it is? It must be those shady oil companies. People complain about oil companies and the price of gas, but I say, even at $4 a gallon, we should thank oil companies. Think what they have to do to bring us a gallon of gas. The oil sucked out of the ground, sometimes from war zones or deep beneath an ocean. To get to the oil, the drills now bend and dig sideways through as much as seven miles of earth. What they find is then delivered through long, billion-dollar pipelines, then put in monstrously expensive tankers to ship it across an ocean. Then it's refined into several types of gasoline, transported in trucks that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars each, until finally it gets to our gas station, which spends a fortune on safety devices so we don't blow ourselves up while filling up the tank. And even after all that, the gas still costs less per ounce than the bottled water they sell at gas stations. If government produced gas, it would cost 50 bucks a gallon, (laughs) and there would be shortages. People also complain about oil company profits, but we should be glad they make lots of money. Profit is what lets them pay for the pollution controls we want them to have and pay to look for more oil, so we'll have oil tomorrow. And how much profit do they make? People think it's a buck or two a gallon, but Exxon's profit is just six cents per gallon. Governments, by contrast, grab an average 48 cents per gallon. That's the average gas tax, as Charles Payne pointed out. It's 66 cents in California. If anyone's greedy and destructive, it's government. Not that oil companies won't rip you off if you let them. One way they do that is to sell us things like high-octane fuel, premium gas. People think premium is better. 
Of course it is better. Keeps your engine cleaner. When I put regular in my car, it runs out a lot faster than when I put plus in it. I'm a little conservative when it comes to my car, so I feel like it's safer to put in more premium gas. But it's not safer. It won't last longer. A few cars with high compression, high revving engines like Ferraris and Corvettes need high octane gas. But for 90% of the cars sold today, check your owner's manual, high octane is no better. You're just wasting your money. And finally, I don't mean to suggest that everyone I interviewed was as wrong as those people you just saw and Bill O'Reilly too. Some people I talked to did know the truth. Ban speculation? No. Why not? Uh, makes for a more efficient market. It's like supply and demand. Some new white oil prices rise. It's a global market, and we're competing on a global market for a scarce resource. Some knew that the ethanol mandate's a scam. If every car is on ethanol, the entire country would have to be corn fields, which is obviously impossible. How many pipelines are there now? I don't know, I'd say 60, but like... That's like a low number. I'm thinking like huge, huge pipelines. Will we run out of oil? No, 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 I don't think so. There's always where to have it. There will, because creative entrepreneurs will find new ways to get more oil and new fuels out of the ground. Unless, of course, the bureaucrats and environmental extremists crush them. Let's not let that happen. That's our show. We'll have another new Stossel episode next Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Fox Business Network. Thanks for watching.